Science has been actually very good, as you say, in destroying false gods like worshiping <laughs> bits of nature. The interesting thing to me is that Sir Peter Medawar, who's quite a hero of mine intellectually, who wrote a wonderful book years ago called The Limits of uh, Advice to a Young Scientist. And he said it's very easy to see that science is limited because it cannot answer even the simple questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going? And what is the meaning of life? And for questions like that, you have to turn to literature, philosophy, religion, and so on. And I, I think the hugely important thing is to realize that science is powerful precisely because it limits the kind of questions that it can address. But often it is incapable of addressing the really big questions, particularly the questions of meaning and purpose in life. And most scientists recognize that uh, like Medawar did, nor can it address the questions of ethics. I mean, science could tell me that if I put strychnine in my grandmother's tea, it will kill her. But uh, science can't tell me whether I ought to do it to get a hold of her money. And things like that point out to us that science is limited, but, and here's where the mistake is made, there's a very common idea around that science and rationality are coextensive. And I think that's absolutely false. In fact, if it were true, half the faculties in Stanford would have to close overnight <laughs> because you'd have no history, you'd have no literature, you'd have no philosophy. And we make the mistake thinking that science equals rationality. And that's a huge mistake. And it leads to what we call scientism, the idea that science is the only way to truth. Now, I love logic. And one of the things that amuses me about that statement, science is the only way to truth, is that it's not a statement of science. It's a statement about science. And so if it's true, it's false. It's logically incoherent. So we need to be humble here. Science can guide us, I believe myself, guide us in a sense and help us. For example, I would want to argue that science, the very fact we can do it, the very fact that the universe is mathematically intelligible, gives evidence, indicator, that there is a mind behind the universe. But although science can point out patterns, designs, this kind of thing, it cannot identify the designer. That has to come from another kind of source. But that other source need not be irrational. I would even question whether there's an, another way to uh, kind of prove or identify the the designer, you know, with a with a rational or 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 irrational uh, approach. Uh, I, for for example, there's a, a whole tradition of uh, of uh, apophatic uh, theology, uh, which of course is very dominant in the uh, Eastern Christianity. You know, I was raised in Greece, so <laughs> I apologize if I'm using terms that may not be very familiar to. To a wide audience, but but basically, what what that approach says is that you cannot really uh, say what what God is, uh, and uh, uh, you know you can only say this is not it, this is not it, this is not it, yeah. and the, the tradition is very strong also in in other uh, religions, uh, uh, kind of not feeling that we're able to answer this type of of major question. Uh, well, I have I, a problem with apophatic theology. I very much appreciate, because I've met it in Russia particularly, I appreciate the idea that trying to pin God down is a very risky business. But on the other hand, if, if I think of getting to know you, John, I could look at you externally, scientifically, and measure your brain waves and all that kind of thing but I'd never get to know you. The only way I can get to know you is if you reveal yourself to me. And I think one of the dangers of apathetic uh, theology is it sometimes forgets the fact that, yes, 
we need to be careful before we try to say God is exactly this. But on the other hand, I believe that God has revealed himself to us. And that's the other side. I think it's perfectly rational and reasonable and not arrogant to accept what God has revealed of himself, particularly in scripture and in experience. So I think there are two sides of it. There's a side that keeps us humble. Let's be careful about putting God in a box. But if God has revealed himself, and if you reveal yourself to me, as you're very generously doing <laughs> this evening, then I'll accept that and I'll understand that. That's a revelation. But the interesting thing is I could never produce that information without interrogating you and listening to you talk. So it seems to me that there are two sides to this whole thing. No doubt. And and uh, obviously, these are not questions that uh, can be answered. I think that <laughs> we, we both agree on that. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that it's it's difficult to to have this complementary approach respected this is what i what i worry the most that that we have people who sometimes feel very strongly about science people who strongly about religion people who feel very strongly about uh, poetry you know i love poetry and, and literature and and they feel that this is uh, all that exists and uh, or, or even even within religion uh, you know people who feel that it's only apophatic or only categorical <laughs> that or, or, or is the dominant way to go. And I, I think that personally, I feel that that humans, uh, we're, we're wonderful, pitiful at the same time. We, we, we need some, some empathy. We need some understanding of, of each other. Uh, uh, we're, we're struggling with these big questions, not being able to, to get easy answers. And I think the, the, the least we can do is just try to respect that that we're all in need of trying to answer these questions that as you say there there appear in the first years of our life <laughs>